gospel of Jesus Christ and to all the world. So, um, as the body of Christ here, we're the body of Christ serving the English-speaking community in Taipei with God's message of grace. That's the most important thing, God's message of grace. I've said this over and over again. I think that, well, I know that very few people in the world understand what grace is because our world has nothing at all to do with it. Everything in this world is based on merit. You deserve what you get. You work hard, you deserve it. But grace is not that way. Grace is the free gift of God's salvation through Jesus Christ. Free gift. So that's our message. It's about God's grace. Uh, I want to begin uh, today with our missions month to just talk about some things that are very important. But before I begin, I'd like to go and tell you a little bit about the missions month that's coming up. We're beginning this missions month at Grace, and there's some things that you can expect. Let me just go through some, some of the speakers that will be coming up. Uh, Mike Robinette is uh, a minute who ministers in India. He's been going there now for 14, 15 years. He's gotten into some very dangerous situations. He works with a church in Mumbai, and this church then has some connections out in the outer areas. But one of the things that they do is they've been involved in rescuing temple prostitutes. It's been uh, very, some of the stories he, he's told is, have been very frightening. But uh, God has put him in a position, and, and you'll, you'll get to meet Mike next week. Mike's about this tall. Uh, he's just, uh, he was uh, fought in Vietnam, came back, was a uh, hippie during the hippie years. He and his wife were, his wife has bright red hair. They were the flower children. They got saved, and God changed their lives. And, uh, and uh, he and I worked together on an internship at Calvary Baptist Church. This guy has such a passion for lost souls. Every time I get around him, it just puts me to shame. But he told me that he and his wife this year have led more people to the Lord than they have in their, their past minutes, past 20 some years of ministry. Just has an incredible passion for souls. So he's going to be uh, speaking to, with us next week. Then Dustin Moore is going to share with us about the needs in Nepal. I shared with you some about my experience there. I traveled with Dustin to Nepal. Uh, and I hope that he'll share some of his story as to why Nepal, because it's interesting how God used uh, just an experience where he was asking God, what now, where God led him to, to that place. And whether you know it or not, Nepal is the fastest growing uh, nation of Christian converts. More Christian converts are making, being made there than, here than anywhere else in the world. Uh, I'm not a surfer. But uh, I've been told that if you are a surfer, you want to catch the wave and ride. And we need to see where God is working and get hand in hand with God and, and work with him there. So I want you to, to get to know Dustin, get to know about the ministry there in Nepal, and then let's see what we as a church can do to see that ministry grow. Third week will be Bill Jeb. He's uh, a church planter in Taitung, a Chinese guy that uh, came out of our came out of our church in Hong Kong. Uh, early on in his ministry, he believed that God wanted him to be a missionary, but he wanted to go to Beijing and to uh, start a church in Beijing. It's very difficult for a person of Chinese descent who's not from China than to go to China and start a church. That's very, very difficult. He found that to be true. And so uh, for, for a period of time, he was able to pastor a church and help a missionary in Hualien, but now he's planting a church in Taidong, and so... I want him to come up and share his ministry and his burden because he's involved in, in the ministry here in Taiwan. And the last Sunday is uh, Jeff Long and his family with Kids International Ministry to challenge us particularly with the ministry in the Philippines, but also with uh, his daughter Josie, who has, she runs a home for sexually abused girls in the Philippines, there, particularly in the Manila area where they're from, and incredible stories. And she told me that she was going to bring one of Josie's girls with her to have her share her testimony about how God delivered her from, from sexual abuse. So I, I really, it's, I think it's a, a great conference, a great opportunity to hear things that God is doing through people in other places around the world and the opportunity then for us as a church to get involved with it. Now, in having a, a missions month like this and bringing in speakers, there's going to be some expenses and there's going to be some costs involved in it. 
going to cost us about $244,000, round it off to $245,000 to do that. Half of that expense is going to their, uh, it's about half and half between the uh, mission's gift and also their uh, expenses of travel, accommodations, hospitality, and so forth. What we wanted to do is this, is we, we wanted to make an investment in each of the ministers there. We'd like to give each of them about 30,000 uh, 30, Taiwan dollars and to, so they can invest in the ministry. Why? Um, it's an opportunity for us to invest in what they're doing. We don't get to go there necessarily. Sometimes we can't go there and actually work with our hands and so, so forth, but we can be involved investing in someone who is uh, involved in things of eternal matters. And, and I'm going to talk about that a bit. The other half of the expense is going to be covering for travel accommodations and hospitality to take care of the missionaries as they come. I, it's, uh, I, I, I kind of understand what it's like to go to a church as a missionary to present my field and to present my heart, my heart's desire. And I, I, I go to a church and I say, you know, here's what God wants us to do. We're going to be for me, it was we were going to go to Hong Kong, be planted in churches there, and then I, I leave and I don't know what's going to come about. Most churches will do what they can to take care of our expenses, but I, it's not about my expenses. The reason that I go to a church to present uh, our, our desire is because we want churches to partner with us in, in the ministry there in Hong Kong. And so that's the reason that these missionaries are coming too. They're, they're, they're wanting us to be able to partner together with them to... to be involved in, uh, in areas of missions that we aren't necessarily going to have the opportunity to go ourselves. So all the income this month is going to go towards, this, uh, towards these missionaries and towards this meeting. Uh, on your uh, offering envelope, there's a place that you can tick that says missions offering. And so anything that comes in this month for missions offering is going to go towards the speakers, for their ministries, for the expenses that we have here, and it's going to cost us about 245000 thereabouts, uh, round, rounded out. Uh, may I say to you that um, I think that this is one of the best ways that we can show our love and appreciation for people who are going places that we won't necessarily be able to go and to say, we want to be on your team, just by being able to, to uh, be an encouragement to them in what we can do as a church. I, again, I, I know exactly what, it mean, what it's like. I've been to churches where they say, here, Pastor Homer or Missionary Homer, uh, here's about uh, $25 for you. God bless you. Well, <laughs> $25 doesn't go a long ways, but um, I, I thank God for it and, and go on because God, I, I, I knew this. And every missionary who comes here, they know this. This is not, this is not about uh, depending on, on individuals to supply their needs. We look at it and we say, you know, God, You'll give me exactly what I need. You'll give me exactly what I need. And, and uh, my experience is he always does. But being a pastor now and being on the other side of the coin and being able to help those who, who, uh, who do come, there's an incredible blessing to be able to send somebody away and to say, thank you very much. You have been a huge blessing to me and to the ministry. And uh, it, it's, it's a tremendous blessing to be on this side because the Bible says... It's more blessed to give than receive. And I want to tell you, it was very blessed to receive. But it's more blessed to give than to receive. So I, I would ask you to do this, if you would like to, if you'd be interested, to host one of these uh, missionaries, uh, Mike Robinette, Dustin uh, Moore, or uh, Bill, or, or Jeff as they come. If you'd like to take them out for a meal the weekend they're going to be here, or if you'd like to take them out and just get to know them a little bit better, uh, hang out with them, whatever, take them shopping, show them some sites. Please, just contact me. I'll, I'll put your name down and, and, uh, and arrange it so that you can go and spend some time with one of these missionaries. It's a great opportunity. Even if all you can do is sit down and say, hey, let's go out and get some coffee. I'd like to meet you and, I, and I'll put them on the schedule. You can go and have some coffee with them and chat up with them and find out what they're doing and opportunities that you can help be an encouragement to them. So uh, that's going to be in these next few weeks. Please, please take the opportunity to do this. So, uh, just a little bit of brief background. This year is the first year that we actually had a missions team. Up until this year, there wasn't much going on as far as our missions were together, uh, uh, as concerned. And so, 
Our Grace Missions team started early on the beginning of this year, met together for a couple of times. The people on that team would include myself and, um, uh, and uh, Mike Everett, Jason Roloff, Jim Ree, and uh, Tim Gillette. Each one of these brought to the table something that I thought would be very beneficial as far as trying to get an overall picture. And, and uh, we have uh, some guys who are involved with budgeting for missions. We have others who have been involved in missions programs in churches. Uh, I do have a little bit of experience with missions for about 30 years or so. And so um, we, we um, took some time to, to see how we were going to go about it. We, we began this with a very small budget, very small budget. And it wasn't hard for us to divvy it up. We were able to do so. But what we've also done is taken 10% of the income of the church and applied that to missions. So if you give to missions regularly and you put on here uh, missions offering, everything that's ticked missions offering goes designated to missions, goes into a separate account that is for missions funds only. In addition to what you give specifically to missions, and typically giving over to missions is over and above our regular tithe. When, when that goes into the missions fund, then in addition to that, because I would like everybody in the church to be involved. I'd like for our whole church to be involved in missions. I think it's, it's something that's vitally important for a church. And so what we do is we take 10% of the, of the entire income that comes in, and we apply that also then to the, to the missions account. What we've, been, what we've done as far as that money is concerned, these are the ones that we presently support. First of all, we support Tammy, who is now involved with uh, Frontier Missions. Uh, she's, she's in a place in her ministry where she has to make some decisions as to where God's leading her into the, in the future. Some opportunities have opened up to her. First part of next year, she'll be sharing some of that with regard to what God's doing with her. We also support uh, Uva Maurer and Taiwan Sunshine. Uh, Uva is also in a place where he, God's moving him in, in different directions too, and he'll be able to share some of that with us. But the, the passion that Uva has with Taiwan Sunshine is that churches would get involved so it wouldn't be resting on the soldiers of, shoulders of one person. And uh, he very much would like to see churches who would sponsor the, the Taiwan Sunshine programs for disabled children. It's kind of like a special Olympics for, for disabled children. And, and, and so we get to be a part of that. We want to be one of those churches. Uh, another one that we support is Chris McKenzie, who is the pastor of the Pearl. He's now presently involved in church planting Canada. When we prepare our budget for next year, we'll be reviewing each one of these and seeing how God would have us to continue on with their ministries. And then Barun Halder is a pastor in Bangladesh. Uh, last year, Barun was here. He came, we brought him here from uh, Bangladesh, and he shared his testimony in his ministry. With the money that we gave him last year for coming here, we took a special offering for him. He went home to Bangladesh, and he bought as many sewing machines as he could with that money. And then he began to teach these ladies how to sew, how to make clothes. So then the clothes that these ladies made, they would be able to sell and be able to have an income, which then they would also be able to give an offering to support the church there. So here, this, this is how it works, folks. I mean, we, we brought a man here. We gave him a gift. He took that gift. He invested it. He invested it in other people, teaching them a trade. And see how that, see how that grows, see how it begins to, to expand and and to me, uh, it's, it's an investment that's well worth uh, our time. We spent as a, as a missions team trying to, and it's not easy. I mean, come on. There's, there's, this world is full of needs. We, we could triple, triple, triple our budget and still not come close to meeting all the needs. I'd even come across what, uh, what our people who have approached our church. Uh, and I would say, I don't say this unkindly, I just say this is the first year when we, we've been, where we're getting started on this. Our missions giving and our missions participation is somewhat paltry uh, compared to what it, what it could be. When we, when we got started last year, la the first part of last year, uh, you remember there was this uh, enormous disaster that took place in the Philippines. I mean, that just really focused our attention on, let's get into the Philippines. We collected clothes. We bought filters for them. We tried to get them to them. We sent teams over there try and minister to help clean up. We just really focused in on that. We got really going almost too quickly on that before we had some other things involved, but, but we couldn't wait. There was such an enormous pressure upon us to, 
to uh, get in there and to get going. But uh, last week at our, at our um, congregational meeting, the question was asked me, how do we decide what we do? Well, let me tell you, here's what Jesus says. Jesus has given a commission to his church, and he's given us a responsibility. And if churches ever want to know what we're supposed to be doing, all we need to do is go right here, and he says, this is what Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the commission that we've been given to make disciples. It doesn't tell us how to make disciples. Sometimes making disciples is going up to a tribal area and simply helping them pick weeds, saying we want to do this because we love you and we want to show you this is what Jesus would do if, when there was this need. Sometimes it means going to a very backwards country and saying, can I work with you? Can I just uh, fellowship together with you? Or maybe, maybe we can teach you and you can teach others. Going to places like uh, Nepal where there's a great need for Bible materials and Bible study. So here is a missions group. This is how we see it. Now, this is a work in progress, okay? When we looked at it as a, as a missions group and we want to see, wanted to say how we see what we need to be doing as a church, we said this. And, and again, this is uh, something that we're still working through. I changed the language a little bit here to make, it, to make it easier for us to understand. Everyone in Grace Church is an invested missional disciple equipped to minister. So what we want is everyone here to be involved in mission. In fact, is we want everyone to be missionaries. Missionaries to the place that God has put you. Where if it's at work or if it's at school, in your family, wherever God puts you, that you would be a missionary. We want to be, see everyone who's equipped as a disciple to serve others, to minister to others, to be out and serving. We desire to train leaders and plant churches around the world. But we have... We have the, the concept of uh, Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the whole world. Um, I guess I got that right, that sequence right. But in order to do that, folks, it takes, uh, it takes a sacrifice. It takes a sacrifice. I, I, I want to say again that we cannot worship God without a sacrifice. And... Sometimes we want to see how much we can do without hurting ourselves. And I don't mean to say we want to, to see how much pain we can inflict on ourselves because there are some who have said in the past that if I can inflict more pain on myself, then that means that I'm, I'm uh, going to be loved more by God. But that's not the case. It's just that throughout the scriptures, there's never a time to worship God without sacrifice. And even those who had nothing their sacrifice would be through their time, their effort, their strength. Those who, who had more would give more. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is, it just takes giving on our part. And God has a whole lot to say about giving. God, throughout his Bible, in fact, is our God is a giving God. How do we know that? He tells us in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How much was God willing to give so that his good news could go out? He gave his own son. I don't know if there's anything closer to our heart than our own children. My, my grandmother, Clara Homer, gave her son Leland Homer to uh, be a missionary. She was so proud that he was going to be a preacher. She was glad that one of her farm boys was going to be a preacher, but she didn't know that God was going to call him to Taiwan. And every year, every five years when he'd come back, she would plead with him, Leland, please, you've spent enough, enough time there. Come back here. Come back home. And uh, after 10 years in the mission field, my dad was killed in a car accident and never got home to see his mom again. A huge sacrifice. But God gave his own son. And now Clara Homer and Leland Homer are together in heaven. I sure, I'm pretty sure they're more interested in Jesus than they are in each other. But uh, still, it's, you know, we, we cannot be involved in God's work unless we're willing to be a giving people. 
So I, I want to take this morning and just tell, talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to go back and look at a Christmas story. Um, we call it a Christmas story. It's actually just a story about some wise men who wanted to give a gift to a young king that they heard had been born. In the, in the story that we're going to read about, these men had heard about, had seen a star rising in the east, and they were very curious about this star. And as they studied through the scriptures, especially through Daniel, they saw the prophecy of the star that was going to rise, and they knew that this was the announcement of a new king. Now, these guys were in Persia, so they traveled from a long distance over a great period of time, hoping to find this king where the star rose and hoping that they would somehow be, uh, be sure to meet that very one. And then the story tells about the gifts that they give. So uh, let's, um, uh, let's read that story, shall we? It's in Matthew chapter 2. It's the first 15, first 15 verses. Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the uh, east, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Christ is to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet. And this is a quote from the prophet Micah, verse 6. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go! Search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose, took the child and his mother by night, and departed to Egypt. Remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. There's some things that I'd like for us to see about this matter of, uh, of giving. Some principles that these, these wise men teach us with regard to giving gifts, why to give gifts, how to give gifts, and some principles that will help us also in the giving of gifts. First thing I'd like for us to see is this. <clears throat> they were thoughtfully planned. Thoughtfully planned. Uh, by that I mean, <clears throat> we're a long ways away now from the time they're going to deliver the gifts. Long distance and long time. But these kings knew that a plan, that, that a gift was expected. They knew that it wasn't going to be the possibility for them to show up on Jesus' doorstep and become up empty-handed. Now, if you're from the East, if you're an Oriental or Asian, you understand this completely. We Westerners are not so inclined in that way. It's nothing for us to show up at somebody's house and uh, they've invited us for dinner and we just show up there and say, hi, thanks for inviting us to dinner, you know. But uh, I know that when we invite... Uh, our oriental friends over, they would never show up at our house without something in their hand to give us a gift. So these wise men understood that a gift was expected if they're going to go and visit the, this, this one who's a king. And so when they were thinking about it, they were planning, what are we going to give? We, we know a gift is expected, so they planned ahead to give a gift that is appropriate. 
Some gifts are inappropriate. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you remember I was telling you about how when I would go visiting in Hong Kong, the common thing to do was to get oranges and to take that as a gift so that we, so we wouldn't show up empty-handed. Why oranges? Because the word for orange in Cantonese is uh, gum and it sounds similar to gold. And so these have these round oranges that look like gold. And so, it, you know, that was an appropriate thing to give. Well, I said, I saw a nice bunch of bananas. And I said, well, why don't we take bananas this time? And uh, they said, no, 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 can't take bananas. Why? Because bananas look like fingers and look like you're asking something. And they just, they just, they're inappropriate. That's all. I mean, nothing wrong. It's just inappropriate. So I, I say that to say that when we think of a gift to give, we need to understand what would be the appropriate gift to give. And here's what these uh, wise men came up with. Three things the Bible tells us. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Why gold? Well, gold is cash. Cash is always a good gift, right? If you don't know what to give at a wedding, to a wedding, uh, uh, to a new couple getting married, give money. You can't go wrong. You know, they might have a dozen toasters, but if you give cash, it's fine. Uh, you, nobody's ever going to look to you and say, oh, how inappropriate. You gave me money instead. It's like, no, man, bring it on, you know. Uh, you can, uh, it always works. And so that's why gold was a good thing to give because cash is always good and it's very practical, very practical. Money spends. And uh, so that was very important for this young couple, too, who Mary and Joseph were not very wealthy. She was just a young teenage, teenage bride, and uh, they gave them this cash. The second thing that they gave is frankincense. Now, frankincense is a sweet fragrance. What kind of gift is this to give? Well, this gift is a kind that's it's a luxury. It's, never, it's not something they would ever buy for themselves. And Mary and Joseph, I'm sure, had no expectations that they were going to be living a life of luxury. And so any items of luxury were going to be something, hey, it's just not in our world. You know, it's just not, not anything we think about. And frankincense would have been one of those things. But think about it for a moment. Now, I, Mary, Mary and Joseph weren't living in the stables at this time. I know at Christmas time we always have, we always have these uh, soft-lighted stables with animals around and the baby Jesus and the... And, and, and the and, and then the wise men around with the camels and so forth. It's not exactly how it happened, but it's kind of soft and fuzzy feelings. The, Jesus is probably anywhere between one year old and two years old, maybe around 18 months or so. And, and so they're living in a home now. But the homes, well, you guys, you were up in the, you were up in the villages this past week. And uh, when I was in Nepal, I had the chance to, to visit some of the farms. <clears throat> You know, I'm not opposed to being a farmer. My, my uh, dad's family was a farming family. But there's some, just some smells, you know. Just some smells you'd probably be very glad not to live with. And frankincense would be one of those incense that they could use to, for a moment, give them a great sense of relief and a great sense of luxury. For some of you ladies, it's like when you ever have the opportunity to go to the spa and just take a hot bath and soak and all that. You know, it's just... It's just a luxury that you wouldn't normally be able to, to enjoy. And so that's, this gift to them was something that was um, very appreciated simply because it was a very special, luxurious gift. Then there's the gift of myrrh. Myrrh is used for embalming. Now, why in the world would you give embalming fluid to a baby who's just been born? Uh, what's, what's the point there? The fact is, it could almost be offensive. But the thing is about this gift, it's important because of its significance. It's the meaning that was attached to it. Sometimes these gifts are the ones that are just the most impressive and, most, and, and truly most special to us. You know, it's like the, it's like the gift that uh, a child gives to mom, a piece of paper that they've written something in, and, 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 and you know, it's just as ugly as can be. But it says something like in broken uh, written words, I love you, mommy. And the, the value of that gift is in its significance, in its significance, the message that it's saying. This was a meaningful gift because of what it said about, his, about Jesus, that he came to earth to be the sacrifice for our sins, that he was going to die. So we have these three gifts. One's very practical, cash, always practical. The other one is very luxurious. Luxurious is just very special. The third one was of great significance. 
They planned in their preparation to, to give these gifts. May I, just, just consider this for a moment. Um, these gifts had to be given by faith. When they're thinking about what they're going to give, the significance of it, the, the practicality of it and so forth, they didn't even know if they were going to find Jesus. All they see is a star in the sky, right? All they see from back east, from back west, there's they're traveling east, there's a star out there. They had to stop over in Jerusalem and say, and ask around, where's this Jesus being born? So what that means is they stepped out by faith to give this gift. They prepared it, got it all ready, it came with them, but they had no idea that they were going to find that person except they stepped out by faith to do it. That's oftentimes very true of the gift that, that, that we give. We plan. We need to know we need to be giving. We know a gift is expected. We also give gifts that are appropriate. And, and may I just say this? I'm very thankful to, today when you gave the offering, you gave cash. You didn't bring chickens or goats or anything in. Uh, when we were in Nepal, it, uh, and these people came for the service, they would bring chickens and goats because they knew that there was going to be a fellowship meeting afterwards. And so to give their offering, to, give their, to do their part for the fellowship me uh, meal to take place afterwards, they would bring uh, chicken or goats and bring it into the pastor and say, here you go, pastor, put it in the pot. And, and thankfully, you don't do that here, okay? Uh, that's why it's a very appropriate for us as we, as we give offering to... Uh, uh, to, to give cash, and thank you very much. So, <clears throat> we also need to realize that there's gifts that uh, uh, are luxurious, that we don't necessarily have to have. I appreciated what was said this morning about the great sound system that they saw up in the, in the tribal church there. I'm very, I'm very grateful for our sound system here. We put out some bucks for it. Do we have to have it? Don't have to have it. But it does, it does add to our service. It's one of those things, and, and you know, uh, for, for me, giving a gift above and beyond, you know, just doing something for, I, I remember when we were visiting in a, in a church back in the States, this uh, uh, young, young couple were just getting started off in their church, and uh, I, of course, when, when I go to a church and speak, they always have a speaker's fee, what they call an honorarium, or they, for churches they call it a love offering, where they give it to the speaker and say, thank you for coming, these are for your expenses and so forth. And I took that back to him, and I said, listen, I can't take this. I just can't take this. And I told the pastor, I said, go out and buy your, go out and buy your wife a dress. I don't know if he did, but he would have made some points if he did. And, uh, but it was just it was something that I could do to say over and above, thank you so much. And we have this opportunity to give gifts like that. Then there's the, the gift of, uh, uh, of sacrifice, or a gift of great significance. When we give, our faith has to undergird our giving too. We, we just do what we can. We trust that God will, will do the rest. So our giving needs to match that, what is exam given as an example for us by these wise men. The second thing I'd like for us to see is they protected their gifts. They protected their gifts, carefully protected. When we uh, travel today, we don't worry too much about uh, thievery. You know, if you're going to spend the night in the airport, you probably want to keep your foot draped over your luggage just in case so it doesn't disappear and that kind of thing. But when we're on the highway, I can't tell you how many miles I've been on a freeway, both here and in the States. I, I've never been worried about somebody jumping out in front of me and saying, hey, give me your goods. It's very safe to travel in this day and age. Very safe to travel. But in the day of these wise men, it was not safe at all. Uh, there were, there were uh, gangs and uh, thieves who, this is their livelihood, was to prey on the travelers, to catch them and take everything they had, and this is how they made their living. So for these wise men to prepare these gifts, then they had to carefully protect them to make sure they would still have them to give to King Jesus. I'm sure they didn't have it advertised with the gold right on the top of the camel and so forth. I think they had these things carefully tucked away. I think that as they were traveling along, they didn't try to see how dangerous they could be and get right close to the cliff there, and, and in case the camels should fall over, I think they tried to keep things well protected because they wanted to be sure they had the gifts there. And, and that's the same thing that's true for us. Uh, we need to understand that we should protect the gifts. Here's what God did, though, for these, these wise men, because they protected the gift that they were going to give to God 
God in turn protected them. What happened? The, God appeared to them and said, don't go back to Jerusalem. If you go back to Jerusalem, King Herod's going to, going to uh, he'll kill you because he wants, that, he wants to know where Jesus is. So he said, don't go back that way. Go back a different way. And oftentimes, in my own family, I've seen how God has protected us as we have, as we have been giving to him. We, we lived out in, uh, on Lantau Island in Hong Kong there, and we were very involved in this church in town. I was pastoring there. We were, we were trying so hard to get that going, and so a whole lot of our resources were going into that. And the, as typical missionaries, I don't know if any missionaries that don't, we were living right on the edge. That's kind of the life of the missionary, living right on the edge. And uh, if <laughs> so, um, it was important for us to be very careful. Well, <clears throat> my daughter Nicole is a sleepwalker. Didn't know that until we found out uh, one night she's on sleep on the second bunk. Woke up, walked right off her bunk and fell onto the floor there in the middle of the night. Uh, broke her arm. Well, we're on an island, and so. Uh, I took her down to the clinic there and had to wake the guy up in the clinic. Immediately got on the phone and called the rescue helicopter from uh, the hospital in, in Central in Hong Kong. And the uh, helicopter came out. Nicole and I got on board, took us over in the middle of the night to the hospital, had emergency surgery, spent the night in the hospital and so forth. It cost me five U.S. dollars. Five U.S. dollars. I am all for national medicine. <laughs> My, my point is this, I mean, God, God protected us as we were protecting the gifts that, that uh, we were giving to him. And I've found this over and over in my own experience and in testimonies of other people who have told how God has just wonderfully protected them. And when we protect our gifts to give to Jesus, we give God what's best for him, he protects us. How do we protect, though, the money that God gives us? How do we protect the things that God gives us? Well, one of the ways we do that is we, we uh, try to keep out of debt. And credit card debt is a huge thing these days, huge thing. Uh, I, just let me give you a, a story about how that affects uh, our lives. This, uh, this young lady that I know who uh, really, has a heart for, really has a heart for serving and helping people, wants to help people. And uh, so... She had an opportunity to, she needed a car and went and bought a new car. Well, you know, I know what it is. You, you have to have a car. The first car I bought was a 1954 Plymouth Savoy. Big boat made out of solid steel and uh, flathead, straight six engine in it. Not that it matters to anybody. It's the car that Candy and I got married in, drove away in. Uh, uglier than can be, but we called it Bertha. And Bertha took us everywhere. It was like a desert schooner, man. It just floated along the road there. <laughs> and uh, $75, you know. And then when I got ready, to used it so it wouldn't go any further, and I sold it for $50. Uh, it was great. Sold it to a guy who loved cars, and he took it all apart and put it back together again. You know, so, so but, but in, in didn't have any debt for car. But uh, this girl, she needed a car. She got uh, one of her siblings to co-sign for her and then bought a brand new car. Well, that means $720 a month in payments. You know what that means? She has got to have a job. She has got to have income. She cannot go where her heart wants to go because she's tied in to paying for a car. That's sad. That's sad. And, and this has to do with protecting what we can give to God by not allowing ourselves to get caught up in these other things that prevent us from going where our heart wants to go. And as a result, uh, my, advice, my advice would be sell the car and free yourself. Just free yourself to go and do what your heart really wants to do. This is how we need to protect then what God's given to us so that we can give, give our offering to Him. The third thing I'd like us to look at is this. <clears throat> Their gifts were given by proxy. Their gifts were given by proxy. What does that mean? Proxy means the authority to act for another. Uh, if you're on a, in a corporation and you're or on the board or something like that and you have to give a vote or 
the shareholders are voting or something and not all the shareholders can be at the meeting, what they'll do is they'll give someone a proxy to vote on their behalf. And that's what that means, to act on behalf of another. So in this instance here, we have the wise men that are coming now and they're giving these gifts to baby Jesus, about a year and a half or so. And what does he know? If they were to give him the gold, what would Jesus do with the gold? He'd probably just play with it. He would have no idea what to do with it. The frankincense, the myrrh, he, he couldn't he just didn't have an idea what, the, what that was all about. So the wise men didn't give the gifts to Jesus. They gave the gifts to Mary and Joseph as a proxy on Jesus' behalf because Jesus was far too young. So Mary and Joseph then received these gifts then on behalf of Jesus. That's the way we give to our church. That's, the way we, that's why we give to the church. The church is the body of Christ. In the New Testament, the New Testament tells us that the local church is the only organization that has New Testament authority to act on behalf of Jesus. The local church is the only New Testament organization that has the authority to act on behalf of Jesus. So why do we have an offering here? Uh, why do we collect an offering? Because it gives an, offer, it gives an opportunity then for us to give to Jesus through his local church. Now, you know, I understand. Some people don't want to do that because they're afraid that we'll abuse it. I understand there are churches that do abuse it. But may, let me just settle this with you, okay? Let me just show you how this works. There's a bookkeeper in heaven. There's a bookkeeper in heaven that's keeping record of all these things. And that bookkeeper keeps a record of what you give to Jesus through the church. He also keeps a record of churches who squander his money and there will be a reckoning day. There will be a reckoning day. For me, it's been, it's been a tremendous privilege to be able to, to give to churches and to see how God has used that to further his kingdom. God knows my heart. I can't always be sure that the money is going to be used exactly how I would want it used. But as I give the gift, I'm, as I give the gift and offering, I am giving that to Jesus Christ. I'm giving that to God. If someone squanders that, God help them. God help them. There will be a day of reckoning. So we bring our gifts to the local church. Our local church is the organization sanctioned by God to operate on behalf of Jesus Christ. The fourth thing I'd like for us to see is this, and I think this is very important, to understand that the gifts that we give, they're given for a purpose. It's not a purpose that we necessarily can see or understand, but it's for a purpose. How did that work here with Joseph and Mary? Think about this. Um, Joseph and Mary had gone to Bethlehem. This was not their home. They had traveled up to Bethlehem, which was the hometown of uh, Joseph where he had to go to be taxed. So they, there they've set up home. These wise men come and give them these gifts. I mean, think about it, folks. You're minding your own business, and here comes this retinue of uh, who knows how many there are. We, only, we don't know how many there are. We say there's three kings because there was three gifts, golden frankincense and myrrh. But nonetheless, one or three, there's still going to be a whole crowd of people, and they come up to your door. And there was a star that showed that this is where the king is. And they make an inquiry and say, hey, we are here to worship the king. And he toddles out, as babies do. Do they walk at one and a half? Anyway, he either toddled or crawled out, and Mary and Joseph say, behold, you're king. And they worship this little baby as the king and, and give these gifts. Very soon after that then, the wise men go back by a different route and God appears to Joseph and he says, Joseph, you've got to go, man. You've got to get out of here. Herod is angry because he thinks there's been a king that's going to usurp his authority born in this town and he's going to kill everyone. In fact, is Herod came in with his troops and every child at two years of age was slaughtered. But Jesus wasn't there. Why? Because the wise men gave a gift of cash to Mary and Joseph who had nothing, so they had the money to go to Egypt. They couldn't go down to the local airport, put down their plastic card and say, free tickets to Egypt. No cash, no traveling. God knew that. God had a purpose for those gifts. God had a purpose specifically for the gold cash 
so that Joseph and Mary had the money that they needed to travel to Egypt in protection of the Son of God and to stay there until God called them back. God knew that purpose. He planned it in the heart of those wise men a long time ago, far away, and made sure it was presented to them so they had it exactly when they needed it. It's amazing how God does that. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Our gifts are given to accomplish God's purpose and will in this world. Let me give you a couple of examples real quick here. Ooh, real quick. The first is this. Back in the late 40s, a young couple by the name of Mary Helen and Leland Homer were going from church to church to raise support to go out as missionaries. Some of you missionaries, you understand what this means. Traveling hours and hours, going from church to church back in the late 40s, it was very typical for a church to say, we want to support you, and the average support was about $5 a month. And getting ready to go to Taiwan, you need a lot of churches at $5 a month in order to get there. So they, they did a lot of traveling. But those uh, churches then, as he would go there present the, the, uh, the ministry, they would promise and we'll support you anywhere from, anywhere from $2 up to $10 a, a month. And then my mom and dad came out here to Taiwan. And when they came out to Taiwan, I've told this story before, so I'll, I won't go into much detail, but my mom and dad both had good voices. I don't know, but I didn't get that. So uh, they could sing. And so they would go out, and, and to sing, my mom would play the accordion. They'd stand on the street corner in Jai. So here you have this young couple uh, singing in English, playing an accordion out on the street corner. And of course, did they attract attention in the early 50s? Are you kidding me? Of course they did. Everybody's checking it out to see what's, what's happening there. And one of the people who came to listen was a little boy who was about 10 years old. His name was Liu Dafu. Uh, and... Uh, Later on, when he came to the Sunday school, we gave, his, gave him his name, David. His name is David Liu. David Liu grew up in the Sunday school. He got saved in the Sunday school. And then, as a teenager, went to one of the youth camps uh, that our church provided. And uh, there, he sensed that God was calling him to go into the ministry. So David Liu became a pastor. He pastored for 40 years up in the city of Banqiao at uh, Zichang Jinli Jiao Hui, the uh, Zichang Baptist Church up there in Banqiao. And, and had a tremendous ministry. All his life he struggled with bad health because of a, a liver ailment, and two years ago he passed away. Uh, had, a, had a fantastic ministry, several people. David Liu was a guy who just loved people to Jesus. And a uh, very personal friend. Helped our family a lot when we came here. I say all that to say this. Those people in America who were sending five bucks to my dad in Taiwan had no idea. Many of the people in the church there had no idea who it was going to because they were giving to the ministries, to the missions in the church. The church then said, we're supporting these missionaries. One of those missionaries was my dad, Leland Homer, who came to Taiwan, who had the opportunity to lead David Liu to the Lord, who had a great influence here in, in, in Taiwan in winning people to the Lord. Second generation, David Homer. David and Candy Homer are going to Hong Kong as missionaries. I traveled for 14 months, went to 150 churches, and the same thing, saying, I'm going to Hong Kong, God's called me to go there, I'm going to plant churches and uh, reach people for the Lord. Church after church said, okay, at that time, uh, the funds had gone up. The average support was about 50 bucks a month. But, uh, that was, I was going to Hong Kong, too, so it was very helpful. And so uh, our family went over to Hong Kong. There was Candy and I and two of our kids. We arrived in, uh, in October, uh, late last day of August, I believe, in 1983 and began a little Bible study there. We, we started a, a, a group on Sunday mornings, and I didn't... Uh, so I had to study Cantonese, and, and I, I was, at that time I was studying Mandarin in the, in the Chinese university, and so I would write out my sermons in English, the complete manuscript in English, because we had people in there, and many, most people in Hong Kong can read the English. And I would hand out, that there were probably about 10 or 12 people, these manuscripts, and they would read along with the manuscript as I read my manuscript, and that's how we started. Uh, my wife would uh, play the piano, well, some of the times, until she got involved teaching the kids in Sunday school. And then we had another, another young Chinese girl, she was only about 12 years old, studying the piano. We'd send the music home with her, she'd practice the music all week long, come back and play it on Sunday. The thing is, we're meeting in this apartment building, and we're in this one flat in the corner here, 
and you walk outside our flat, the church there, and walk right next door here, there's another flat right, right, right next kitty corner to us. And uh, so every morning, Sunday, we'd start singing, and they had to wake up. And, uh, and, and it was a guy by the name of uh, Y.Y. Pun, Pun Yao Yun. And, uh, and he was uh, married to a Filipino lady, and she was Catholic, he was Lutheran. She was, uh, spoke English, he spoke Chinese, so they couldn't decide which church to go to, the English one or the Chinese one. So uh, since we were uh, uh, English, they just came to ours. Uh, and besides, all he had to do was open his door, walk out, and turn, and walk into our church. And so it's like, <laughs> big, no big deal. And it was either that or just, or, or just complain about the singing. But uh, Y.Y. Pun got saved, man. Y.Y. Pun came, and, and uh, he got saved in our church there, and, and he knew that God was uh, touching his heart for missions, and, but he didn't want to go. Until one Christmas, his wife was kind of snuggling up to him, and she said, dear, what is that lump on your neck? Again, I've told this story before here, too. And, she, and they found this lump. It was cancer, and he and, uh, went to the hospital there. The doctor told him, uh, you're going to have to have all this surgery and so forth. And so Y.Y. came to me, and he said, you know, Pastor, I know that God's calling me to go to China, to start churches in China. And again, you have a Chinese going to China there. It's not, not easy work. Besides that, he told me this. He says, I hate the communists. He was uh, Kuomintang all the way, man, Kuomintang, because he had come out of China. And uh, anyway, there's the whole political thing there. And he says, I don't want to go. But um, he says, I know God's calling. And as soon as he yielded to that calling, God healed him and remarkably healed him. And so Y.Y. Pun then began making these trips up to the inner part of China in Hunan and Hubei and uh, meeting up with people, starting up these small fellowships. And he started 13 churches up in, that, uh, up in those areas there. I had the privilege one time to travel with him, travel at night, travel in the winter, big old coat, because this would have been late 80s or so forth. It wasn't, uh, still wasn't real comfortable for Americans going in there. I had a hat on so they couldn't see my big nose. And uh, so we traveled into the scariest time was when I got to a hotel and we got up for breakfast and there was a table full of policemen there and they're watching this white guy coming in. They came up and visited us in the room and took my passport and said, you're not supposed to be here. Ooh, when you take my passport, that's very frightening. But to the, the, make a long story short, I was up there to go and visit one of the churches way, way up there in the hills and we baptized that day 25 people to start another church up there. Um, I say all that to say this. Uh, Brother Puddin is now many years on into the ministry. Uh, there's uh, 30 or 40 pastors that come down, and, they, and he teaches them in a, in a Bible school in Canton there. Uh, they have more freedom of movement. But the churches, those churches that support me back in the States, they have no idea. They have no idea. All they're doing is they're giving to the missions efforts of their church. In the missions effort of their church, I happen to be one of the missionaries. And they send this money to me, and I was able to get a church started there in Hong Kong, which 25 years later is still, still going. And uh, Y.Y. Poin came out of that church. His ministry has been in China and reaching there. You, you know, when we get to heaven, we have no idea how God has taken that little gift that we've given and multiplied it in the souls of people around the world. I, I got to tell you this. I don't have money in stocks and bonds because I don't. I, I barely have a 401k. But I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I have an investment that I'm going to see in eternity one day. Guys like Y.Y. Pun, like Andrew Au in Hong Kong, I, he's, he's a guy who worked with me. He started two churches there in Hong Kong. I get to be a part of that. Every month, he writes me a letter and tells me about people who got saved in his church, people who got baptized. And that's my investment. I'll see them in heaven. Brother Y.Y. Pun. He's had an enormous effect. Just the fact that God allowed me to, to lead YY to the Lord? Are you kidding me? What a privilege that was. And so, we have a saying in English, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. But you can send it ahead. You can send it ahead. And I am so looking forward to the time when I can get to heaven and just see the little bit that I've been able to do in helping some guy in some forlorn place to go about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. God blesses him, souls are saved, and we'll get together and have something. I just can't imagine anything that is more exciting 
and more eternally rewarding than to be involved in mission. So that's what I want to encourage you to be thinking about this week. I want to just leave you with this, the very last, very last slide, and that is give yourself head, heart, and hands. Give your time. God gave it to you so that we could invest it in his work. Give your resources that we may be able to reap eternal returns. Father in heaven, thank you so much that in your providence, you have invited us to join you in the redemption of this world. You have decided that your work will be done through your church, and we are your church. And you allow us to be involved in work that has eternal value, a work, that, an investment that we can enjoy throughout eternity. Help us to see this world through your eyes. Help us to see the resources that you've given to us through your eyes. Help us to simply learn to trust you and, and to know that you will keep everything, you'll keep every record, you'll keep all of it. I trust you, Lord Jesus, that you'll work in our hearts during this next month. Speak to us about the great need we have for taking the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ throughout this world. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Please be praying for the missions uh, month. And those speakers, uh, Mike Robinette will be here next week. So we'll see you then. Thanks. God bless you.